All right, this is Nate Richardson. I'm going to read to you my notes on this terrific book called The Collapse of Parenting by Leonard Sachs um, the, uh, and some commentary. The first, I'll go over the table of contents really quick to give you an idea of what we're going to do. The first, uh, so the title, full title is The Collapse of Parenting, How We Hurt Our Kids When We Treat Them Like Grown-Ups. And... Part one is problems, part two is solutions. So part one, problems. Chapter one is the culture of disrespect. Chapter two is why so many kids are overweight. Chapter three, why are so many kids on medication? Chapter four, why are American students falling behind? Chapter five, why are kids so fragile today? And then part two, solutions. Chapter six, what matters? Chapter seven, misconceptions. Chapter eight, teach humility. Chapter nine, enjoy. Chapter 10, the meaning of life. And the solutions are kind of mixed throughout the whole thing, of course. Okay, this is so exciting. Let's jump in. So first off, um, uh, let's see here. Um, about uh, the author, Leonard Sachs is a family physician, MD, and a PhD in psychology. He's conducted more than 90,000 office visits as a practicing physician between 1989 and today. He has given hundreds of lectures on parenting and related topics around the world. His other books are Girls on the Edge and Boys Adrift and Why Gender Matters. His work is well-researched and easy to read. And you can contact him at leonardsachs at gmail.com or leonardsachs.com. These are my notes and impressions of the book and do not represent all ideas of the book. When I add my commentary, I preface it with note. I um, And I do not put many sources he cites into these notes. Please refer to the full text for related studies. He also shares many more fun and helpful stories than I report here. My intent is to give a quick highlight of key principles and commentary. All right, so the theme of the book. For authoritative parenting to work, the parent has to have authority. The parents used to be the ones in charge, but now the kids raise each other, and there's a culture of disrespect and rudeness the children have toward everyone, toward their parents and even their peers. They rely on their peers to raise them, not their parents. They think that the parents don't deserve to know what's going on in their lives. They think that they should be the one who gets to choose what school to go to, etc. Parents used to be the ones who decided all this. So parents aren't really parents anymore. Note, I have a concern that he might suggest the that the age before adulthood is quite old, such as the mid-20s. Of course, um, many today do. He correctly defines adolescence as the time between when someone can have children and when they are considered adults. But I think it is dangerous to have a longer and longer expectation of kids to be biological adults, as in post-puberty, without being cultural adults. I foresee a future day when culture will have increasing respect for mature youth as adults in society. Today, our youth simply aren't mature whatsoever. And obviously, I am for keeping all the laws. So, just saying that I think uh, there's something weird going on when your cultural age of adult is way off from your biological age of adult. All right, moving on. Uh, so, um, let's see here. Uh, let's see. One or two things before I jump into chapter one. Uh, one or two really cool things. Um, he says, you can explain your expectations, but you don't need to negotiate. Parents must command. Um, a little bit on his preview on his education stuff. American kids are more disrespectful to their teachers than Australian kids, etc. In Australia, when a kid leaves the classroom, they say, thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Great lesson. They, some think it is going to, uh, that it allows for higher creativity in America to allow students to be so disrespectful, but not so. Now, um, let me just mention, if you are interested in the text of these notes, they're free at my website, richardsonstudies.com. And this video is, of course, uh, just free too. That's, uh, so richardsonstudies.com. The YouTube channel is Richardson Studies. And hopefully I'll branch out elsewhere as well as in the future. But Okay, America is unique in using all the technical gadgets in the classroom. There's no proof that these actually help. We don't need to turn to the classroom into an arcade room. Other countries without this stuff are doing way better in education, even though America spends more money on education. Education is less about technology and more about respect for teachers and good teachers. Another really great point. Don't let your kid go to another kid's house where violent video games are played. 
talks about having the same expectations for when your kids are out of your house as when they are in. He says it's okay to be the only kid without a cell phone throughout high school. And he says it's often the parents who complain about this more than the kids. The kid's like, oh, yeah, you don't have a phone. Okay, whatever. The parent's job of limited setting is more important than the kid liking the parent. Okay, he does really good at explaining the parent needs to be a parent. All right, so part one problems. Introduction. Parents adrift. If a kid is hungry enough, they will eat essential healthy foods like broccoli and other cruciferous vegetables that they need to prevent vitamin deficiencies and poor health. Parents are letting kids as young as eight decide what school to go to against their better judgment. Parents today mistakenly think that being a good parent means letting kids choose everything. They think that's how kids learn and that parents can't make all the decisions for them or they won't learn how to decide on their own. Today's parents are unwilling to force a child to go to a certain school because they don't want to deal with the complaining that might ensue. 40 years ago, parents sending a kid to a private school, etc., would not they would not let the kids choose and they would overrule the kid's preference for their sake. Today, it's common to let the kid have the final say. One dad saw drunk kids at his house. He bought a breathalyzer, when he found a, and when he found a drunk kid, he called the kid's parents to bring him home, which they did, but the parents were upset that he did this, thinking that it was okay for underage drinking at uh, people's houses due to the argument that they're going to do it anyway. The boy's parents were offended by the phone call and did not thank the dad. The, uh, they didn't use the breathalyzer often, but they kept it, kept it in view for parties. Okay, just the patent absurdity of this oh they're gonna do this anyway let's just let them uh you know so um big red flag there um one mother who advocated letting kids drink at a young age because they're going to do it anyway was seen when her kid got in the car to pick him up from school she asked the kid how he was doing he said turn around shut up and drive and she did so again letting kids be the boss this is not good American kids are now less resilient, more fragile, more overweight, less likely, uh, and more likely to be diagnosed with mental problems. Over the past three decades, there's been a massive transfer of authority from parents to kids. Let kids decide has become the mantra of good parenting. When the kid, what the kid believes and wants to know as important or more than what the parent sees as best. Oh yeah, what the kid believes and what he wants is seen as more important than what the parent knows is best. The, these well-intentioned changes are profoundly harmful to kids. Now, chapter one, the culture of disrespect. Humans are different from animals because of culture. Customs are learned and differ between communities. Kindergartners are supposed to be pushed to be less, uh, are, are being pushed to be less playful and more academically rigorous. This is not good. The kids aren't learning proper socialization and the authority of parents in our society is less and less. So the kids aren't going to learn it from their parents either. Because uh, basics like don't hit, share, clean up, these aren't being learned. It used to be that kids wouldn't join a club if their parents didn't approve of the club. What the parents said mattered. Not so today. He asked hundreds of kids at different venues, quote, If all your friends joined a certain social media site, but one of your parents had a concern about it, would you still join? Close quote. The kids didn't answer yes and no. They just laughed. To them, the answer was obvious. You join. Note, social media, okay, so again, when I say note, that's kind of when I'm going off into my own little tangent here. Note, social media on phones is one of the most toxic influencers of our time, and Dr. Sachs points this out excellently in this book. Elder Packer pointed this out in a pointed way. He said, quote, largely because of television, instead of looking over into that spacious building, we are, in effect, living inside of it. That is your fate in this generation. You are living in that great and spacious building, close quote. That was in 2007 in a BYU speech he gave called Lehi's Dream and You. Okay, now back to the uh, text. Parents are reluctant and insist that, oh, parents are reluctant to insist that time with family is more important than time with same age peers. Parents are suffering from role confusion. They are unsure what authority they have and how to exercise it. Kids' attitude toward their parents these days is ingratitude seasoned with contempt. It used to be that kids would learn right and wrong at schools, but not so anymore. Another side note, kids' books these days don't even try to teach morals. Their only aim is to make it as entertaining as possible, to sell the most books possible, and to just get the kids to read. They don't include, they don't dare include any moral teachings in the books, just in case that would offend some kids or bore some kids, maybe turn away some parents. 
I went to a school assembly a few years ago where a young author told a story about how when he first released his popular nonsense kids books, an old man marched up to him and scolded him for making these books which teach no morals whatsoever. The audience at the assembly laughed at the story. It was intended to be funny. But I agree with the old man. Authors and influencers have a moral obligation to teach good morals. It used to be common. It used to be on the public radio. You'd hear people praying and, and quoting scripture. You know, the schools, they'd pray in the schools. They'd have the Ten Commandments up everywhere. Uh, the politicians would say, hey, I'm going to help promote God's ways. And it's just gone. It's gone now. We used to have that. And you can have that. But it's gone now. So um, I believe the author remembered this story about the old man who rebuked him because deep down he knows the old man is right. The spirit is not letting him forget that experience because it was important. Bravo to the old man who spoke up. All right, back to the text now. When kids misbehave, it's less controversial to suggest that the kid has oppositional defiance disorder or hyperactivity disorder than to suggest that the parents need to train the kid. They turn to diagnoses and medication rather than parents working harder at training the kid to have social skills. And a side note, I guess I'll say to be nice uh, and to be, you know, fair that there are some conditions where medicating is, is appropriate and diagnosing. Uh, and the doc and Dr. Sachs, you know, I think he understands that as well. But he, a big point he makes throughout the book is that we've way gone overboard, way overboard on the diagnosing and the medicating. And he points out how in America it's way worse than everywhere else. OK, let's get back to this here. Parents today shoulder a greater burden than prior generations now that they are the only ones teaching social skills and they have less tools to do it. It's like uh, you'd say, you know, it takes a village to raise a kid, right? Well, now that village is training them up in the wrong morals and in the entitlement generation and in the, you know, um, and the community. It's like Elder Robert D. Hales said. He said the, the, the church and the society used to be really similar in their values. But now it is so different, so different, which is why we have to buckle down and be really intentional parents. Um, let's see here. And every now and then I'll plug for homeschool because I think that's a brilliant way to to um, reestablish that uh, parental authority and reestablish those family relationships and, and reestablish the sanity for our children. Um, okay, moving on. Parental authority isn't about enforcing with discipline. Parental authority is about a scale of value that parents matter more than same age peers. Um for the majority of human history, kids have learned culture from adults. Now they're learning it from other kids. Note, I believe Jesus said something about this when he said, if the blind lead the blind, they'll both fall into the ditch. Going on, American kids today don't learn culture from grown-ups. They have their own culture, the culture of disrespect. They learn it from their peers and teach it to their peers. Several decades ago, the popular song was, I want to hold your hand, the Beatles, right? Today, the popular song is, I want to beep you. Uh, a radio edit version played, but the extremely popular version was the uncensored version. It reached number one in the United States. Note, still think the U.S. is a Christian nation? Elder Cook recently said, quote, The goal of honoring the Lord and submitting ourselves to his will is not as valued in today's society as it has been in the past. Some Christian leaders of other faiths believe we are living in a post-Christian world, close quote. He said that in 2017 in a general conference talk called The Eternal Every Day. That was Elder Cook. A post-Christian world, folks. Think about that. Um, another really great point. I just finished reading Jonathan Kahn's book on the return of the gods. And he talks about how a pre-Christian world, they had their problems, right? Their, you know, their human sacrifice altars and this and that. But the, a post-Christian world is way worse. And because we got our holocausts, we got our communists uh hundreds of millions got killed we've got our abortions you know mi uh, millions getting killed and so he, he makes this important point that a post-christian society is way more dangerous than a pre-christian society because look at what jesus said he said in the story about the demon that was in the house it got kicked out they swept out the house but then the house was empty so seven demons came back in right so um, the, the state, the last state was worse than the first. So we're in a situation here where, uh, 
it's it's worse than it, it was before we were a Christian society. It's because, right, we had that light and truth and we rejected it. So this is what we get. All right, moving on now. Um, let's see here. Kids wear t-shirts saying, do I look like I care? Or out of your league? Or is that all you got? Or you look like I need another drink? Or find me another drink, you're still ugly. Or I don't need you, I have Wi-Fi. Or you looked better on Facebook. This is disrespect culture. The Disney Channel actively promotes disrespect and undermines the authority of parents, and I'll say especially dads. It shows it, it shows depict parents being frequently absent and ignorant when compared to the kids. Talking animals are shown to be more insightful than fathers. In the 1960s uh, to the 80s, the parents were shown as competent leaders. There are no kids shows these days that depict parents as reliable and trustworthy. Two generations ago, American teachers taught right and wrong in plain terms. Do to others what you'd have done to you. Note, a uh, little tangent here. As a school teacher now, I am shocked to encounter kids who say, quote, I only respect people who respect me, close quote. They've missed the whole point of, the, of respect. They see no problem with treating others poorly that they don't like. They are quick to find fault with others and justify their extreme rudeness and disrespect. The author points out how kids are starting to tell teachers to shut up. This is completely unacceptable, but let me just say it's worse than that. There's a tragic trend in limiting teachers giving them from giving them any sort of corrective consequences for bad behaviors for the kids. And the schools are becoming zoos where the teachers are the doormats. The kids spend eight hours a day at these places. Is it any wonder they go home and treat their parents with contempt? Uh, parents and teachers, now back to the text, parents and teachers don't, today don't command, they, they ask, they question. The kids answer only with the answer they know they want their parents, that they're, what the parents want to hear. To assert your authority is to communicate culture to the next generation. Prolonged childhood in humans is how culture is passed on. When parents mean more than peers, the parents can teach right and wrong in a meaningful way. They can help the child develop a stable self base a stable self based on their nature and mission rather than on social media likes. Parents are the ones who can instill a love for quality music, art, and education. Note, much of what is listened to today could not be classified as music. Same for art. Good parents can help kids mow past all the weeds, which some of which are pushed by, pushed by kids and adults. And help the, you, parents need to help their kids get to the real fruit. Once they've tasted that good, then they'll recognize, oh, this other stuff's trash. I know what good is. It's like, uh, you know, when Moses sees God and then he sees Satan, he's like, uh-uh, no. This, there's a big difference here. I, I'm not an idiot. I've seen the good. I, you, you can't mess with me. So show him the good. Okay, back to the text. In the 20th century, every kind of authority became suspect in Europe and America. It's great that people got rights and equality, but we forgot that children shouldn't be treated the same way as adults. The first job of a parent is to teach culture to the child, and authoritative parenting requires authority. Note, responsibility always comes with rights. Maybe we should hatch up a bill of responsibilities. Um, back to the text. In America, we think new means better. You even see it in our architecture. It's more common in America than elsewhere to tear down old buildings and put new ones up. Note, some of that, of course, is related to our prosperity and ability to upgrade, but it's still a good point. We are losing respect for all things old, including people. It's also puzzling why we're voting for our government to spend more and more money, more and more debt-based money. We, we don't have um, to replace old buildings with new. So we really, it's a facade, and we're just, it's getting worse and worse. I was talking to my wife yesterday. I told her, you know, I think the ideal city office building would be a, a, a teepee. <laughs> Okay, in America, the celebration for, of youth, for youth's sake, uh, and we're back to the text here. In America, the celebration of youth for youth's sake is more pronounced than anywhere else. Products are advertised in America as being good because they are newer. In America, billboards, they advertise plastic surgeons to make you look younger. You don't see these advertisements in Europe and elsewhere. In America, we value youth more than maturity, and this undermines the authority of parents. Progress now means taking away from man what nobles him and selling it cheaply for what debases him. 
Okay, in other countries, people know the stories of their ancestors. They know the history of their country, and they speak of it with pride. They wear the clothes their parents had, the kilts, etc. They are more than just museum pieces. They're to be worn whenever the occasion arises. Could you imagine American youth wearing clothes of their ancestors? Youth elsewhere do so proudly. Parents mistakenly think that a child being independent when they skip a family vacation Oh, they think a child is being independent when they skip a family vacation and go stay at a friend's house instead. Big mistake. The kids are still being dependent. They're just transferring that dependency from their parents to their peers. This results in the child's top priorities becoming pleasing their peers. The parents become an afterthought, a means to another end. So parents, you've got to insist that those kids come with you on those family trips and don't let them bring friends along because then they just bond with the friends the whole time. It's supposed to be time for bonding with family. Um, it's hard to say no to a child you love, but parents must do this. Note, this is sometimes called tough love. It is an essential element of wholesome love. This is why parenting can be excruciating at times. To express your love, you have to say no, and the child likely won't understand fully for a long time. Parents must have underdeveloped people. They, they help Underdeveloped people make good decisions in the vulnerable stages where they aren't aware of the dangers, etc. Back to the text. If most of the good times happen when kids are spending time with other kids, it's no wonder that kids won't want to spend time with adults. Parental authority needs to be exercised so that the kid has positive experiences with the parents rather than all their spare time for positive things being with peers. Today in the U.S. and Canada, kids' primary attachment is to other kids. Note, the same goes for marriage. Ensure you're involved in those fun times, not just your spouse going off to play with other adults without you all the time. And, you know, it's crazy because uh, it, it seems like kids these days want to just, you know, and when I say these days, I'm talking about when I grew up not that long ago. Um, the, the, the name of the game was to have unlimited time with peers and minimal accountability to parents. That was the name of the game. That was the that was the way to be cool. It was it was uh, the ultimate um, way to social prestige and the and it's um, the you know the more family based stuff we can do the better and uh, we can we can tr revive that family based culture instead of parents going off to do something go as a family hey invite another family but make it family 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 okay let's go on here um, when many kids today feel their life is None of their parents' business and feel the parent is intruding whenever the parent tries to speak with them. They are rude to their parents, but cheerful with their peers. When the parent, when the kid is withdrawing like this, it's a relationship problem and the kid is no longer attaching to the parents, only to the peers. If you're just trying to get your kids to love you rather than training them morally, the odds are you won't get them to love you. You lose both. But if you train them morally, they often will love you because they'll eventually learn, hey, he did that. Thing for me that no one else would do um it's like that uh was it king lear shakespeare's king lear where he has the the one daughter that actually does love him that's not just just sucking his money all his money out of him and um where you know she has to say hey you know you're just getting taken advantage of and being treated like crap and um this isn't a real you know appropriate relationship you've got here Okay, going on. Uh, let me add one more note here. Uh, it is this about um, <clears throat> about just trying to get your kids to love you instead of training them morally. Uh, this is an important point because there will always be the more fun, exciting parent out there or the more fun, exciting peer group to a child that they could be spending their time with rather than their parents. So the parent has to do his duty to teach morals and to create wholesome recreation as a family and limit peer time. Back to the text. Parents are to instruct, lead, and even command their children. Everything is out of balance when this is switched around and the child is the boss. The more you try to earn your children's love, the more pathetically unsuccessful you'll be. Parents who put their child's wishes first uh, only earn their child's contempt. But parents who are responsible in their duties to train their children do find that typically their children love and respect them. Children who get what they want, when they want it, who live in the culture of pure disrespect are not well equipped to handle pressures of naturalization and adulthood. 
sometimes you have to wait before you get to eat the donuts, and sometimes you don't get to eat the donuts at all. That's life. Moving on to chapter two, highlights on chapter two, why are so many kids overweight? The trend started in the 1970s and continued through the mid-2000s where the trend tapered. Overweight kids, not merely obese, but uh, not merely overweight, um, but obese, okay, obese kids have gone from 4% to almost 20% in less than four decades. The New York Times bragged about Michelle Obama's kid exercise program being successful, but all that happened was uh, very young children, as in two to five, were, weren't quite as obese, and there was no data for older children. Their obesity reverted back to the obesity rate of the 2000s, which is good, but still not nearly where they should be. Fitness is not the same thing as slenderness. Many skinny kids can't run a quarter mile without huffing and puffing. Fitness for the American kids was 52% in 1999 and 2000, but then in uh, 2012, it fell to 42%. And the study controlled for economic status, race, etc. A pediatric preventative cardiac uh, clinic is a new thing. In other words, we don't just have to worry about kids having heart problems. The norm today in America, as recently as the 1970s, used to be uh, that kids eat what's for supper or they go hungry. Nowadays, kids choose what's for supper. Okay, note, this is another excellent example where kids simply aren't mature enough to be making these serious decisions. Um, parents could probably use a wake-up call on how important nutrition is, right? Because they're probably in ignorance a lot of the time, thinking it doesn't really hurt them that much. But it's sad because it does. Uh, let parents be parents. Restore their authority. Don't confuse agency with training. Parents will be held accountable for letting their kids run wild. Of course, when I say run wild, I mean freedom to indulge in excessive behaviors with no repercussions. Kids these days do need more running in the wilderness. That's not what I'm getting at. Back to the text. Family diet standards used to include no dessert until you eat your vegetables and no snacking between meals. The number of times American families eat at fast food restaurants has recently increased over 200%. Michelle Obama made a school policy of junk food uh, and more uh, promoting, uh, providing more healthy food. And the results uh, we saw included a lot of healthy food in the trash can and a lot less kids getting school lunch at all. Of course, uh, school lunch itself is just one more socialist thing that we didn't need in the first place. Michelle said schools should put more effort into marketing healthy food, but as kids today grow up in a culture where their desires are paramount, um, this isn't going to work because they're just going to, if, if they see the healthy food and the unhealthy food, they're just going to choose the unhealthy every time. Uh, school lessons, what you need to do is deprive them of the unhealthy. School lessons are often presented as entertainment. University professors are graded by students based on how much, how fun their classes are. Kids are used to eating junk food and won't be easy to, that won't be easy to change. In affluent schools, uh, where was I here? Change. In affluent neighborhoods, kids are bringing their own unhealthy lunches to school. Just offering healthy choices while still offering unhealthy ones won't result in consistent healthy choices. We can't expect them to make that mature choice. It's good that we are trying to get uh, school food more healthy, but it doesn't work when kids are so entitled that they can still access junk food. Okay, uh, We can't expect them to choose water over wine if we're just constantly offering them unlimited wine, guys. Okay, a, a note here. This is one of the reasons public schools are so toxic, even just the food. Of course, the attitudes they learn there are even more toxic. But how likely is your child to choose water over wine in these situations? You can't just offer kids luxury versus humility and expect them to consistently choose the more virtuous humility. They're kids. Okay, give them a break by being the boss, by having that authority, by uh, not, you know, putting their life on the line, by uh, giving them these choices. I think it borders on the unreasonable to think that these little bodies could consistently say no to such toxicity all around them day in and day out. Uh, it's, it's like, you know, it's like offering them drugs all the time and saying, oh, you can, here's some drugs and here's some, you know, salad. I hope you make a good choice, but it's up to you. No, we can't do that. And we know more and more that this food is, is addictive and is, the, is a segue to even worse drugs and that you're more likely to die of obesity than smoking. So... Let's face it, our kids are addicted to junk food and they've been exposed uh, to it for years at school. And the extent of our ignorance and permissivity uh, at, at, 
they've been exposed to it for years at school and they've been exposed to it at home to the extent of the home's permissivity and ignorance. Parents, protect your children. You no longer live in a wholesome society. That's it. Times have changed. Wake up. The end is here. This introduces me. Uh, this introduces one of the mighty themes of this book. You can't offer kids both virtue and vice. You have to restrict the vice. You are the guardian, not the butler. You have to show them by their experience the benefits of virtue over vice. By their experience. As the prophets say, they must stand in holy places so they can gain experiences with the Holy Ghost so that when they encounter the lower realm, they'll recognize it for what it is. We can't just constantly set them up for failure here. Parents, uh, okay, now going back to our text here. Let's see here. Uh, parents are now carrying bags of snacks for the drive to and from school. Heaven forbid the kid experiences one minute of hunger. Parents are overly concerned about kids becoming hypoglycemic. Animals with free access to food become fatter than animals with scheduled access to food, even when it's the same amount of food. Kids who never experience hunger will grow up to be fatter and psychologically weaker. Rather than only allowing dessert for um, after eating their broccoli, it now becomes, okay, you can have dessert after three bites of broccoli. The parents' standards are slipping. No eat your broccoli, no, no dessert, period. Parents beg their children to eat greens, and the kid feels like they've done their parent a favor if they do so, and that their parent owes them something. So don't ask or beg. You have to tell. Restrict rewards when they don't comply. Kids today are watching lots of television, more than an hour and a half a day. The most common leisure activity in the recent past was outdoor play. Not so anymore. Furthermore, back in the day, a family had one TV set, and they were all watching TV together. So, uh, And there were only a few shows on TV, and they were more wholesome shows. Today, all that's changed. The American average child now spends 50 hours a week in front of a screen, 70 for the teenager. Just a generation ago, kids spent all their time playing outside, and they only came in for meals. One mother asked her child, It's such a beautiful day. Why don't you go play outside? The child responded sincerely, But where would I plug in my Xbox? Children now have less time for play than they used to, and the play is more likely to be organized and supervised by grown-ups. The biggest change now is kids would prefer a screen. Many schools have banned dodgeball due to theoretical liability issues and supposed bullying out of concern that such a game might lower a child's self-esteem. In 1969, 41% of kids walked or rode their bike to school. By 2001, it dropped to 13%. There's, if there's a grocery store within a mile of your home, take a daily or every other day walk to it with your kids and carry the groceries home. Less sleep at night means more obesity, and particularly so for young children. When you're tired, your brain plays tricks on you and says, I'm very tired, I deserve junk food. Ages 2 through 5 need 11 hours a day of sleep. 6 to 12 need 10, 13 to 18, at least 9. At 10 years old, they're only getting 9 hours. At 15 years, they're only getting 7.3. At 17, they're only getting about 7. Age 6 to 18 kids are sleep deprived. American kids today getting significant they're getting significantly less sleep than American kids 20 years ago. And he talks later about how ADHD symptoms mirror sleep deprived symptoms to a T. When kids have screens in their bedrooms and they uh, don't have self control to turn those off when it's time to sleep, the bedroom should be for sleeping. When the AAP came out with these guidelines to not have screens in the bedroom, the media just mocked it as an impossible standard. And note, the church has said this for a long time too, not to have the screens in the bedrooms. I don't know why everybody's giving their kids phones. It's ridiculous. Uh, and and not even putting limits on them either. Um, okay, going on here. Uh, so, so yeah, the media is, is definitely not on the parents' side. It's not on the side of science. The, um, AAP says these guidelines, and the media just laughs at it. Since 2011, affluent American kids are reporting that their favorite thing to do by themselves is sleep. The culture of dis... Because they're so behind. The culture of disrespect leads to kids not eating vegetables, kids not doing chores, more likely to play video games, and less likely to sleep when they should. The most disrespectful kids are most likely to become fat. Many studies have reported this. Chronically defiant and disrespectful kids are three times as likely to become obese as respectful kids. Slender kids who are disrespectful are five times more as likely to become obese. Many parents today give in when their defiant kids insist on junk food. A 90s study in New Zealand showed some of the defiant kids are skinnier because the parents decide what's for supper. If the defiant kid doesn't want it, they go to bed hungry. Okay, now highlighting chapter 3. Why are so many kids on medication? Buckle your seatbelts for this one. 
Defiance of the kids is also leading to more diagnosis of ADHD and pediatric bipolar diagnosis. It's normal for kids to get mad and have mood swings. It's not necessarily bipolar disorder. But parents don't know how to deal with these behaviors, so they are turning to diagnoses and medication. Parents need to set and enforce consistent rules, limits, and consequences. Kindergarten class used to teach respect, courtesy, manners. Now they're just teaching grammar. And kids aren't equipped to teach the kids these things. Parents aren't equipped to teach the kids these things. So we have kids who are never learning them. Parents today don't teach common rules of civility to their kids because, for one, their parents don't need, uh, don't need to teach it to them. Their parents, uh, d their parents didn't need to teach it to them. And for two, they're uncomfortable asserting parental authority. The job of the parent is to teach self-control, to teach what is and is not acceptable, to establish boundaries and enforce consequences. Two decades ago, that was common sense. Um, in 94, it was unheard of for someone under 20 to be diagnosed with bipolar. For every one kid diagnosed with bipolar in 94, 43 kids were diagnosed with it in 2003. Bipolar is typically weeks to months for each cycle, and in America, they're saying that for kids, it happens in just a few minutes. They call it rapid cycling. Mood swings being energetic and irritable for normal uh, are normal for uh, some kids, for lots of kids, for most kids. It's not just bipolar. They want to give your kids Risperidol and Seroquel and other adult bipolar drugs. Kids who have not been disciplined are going to scream in the toy store for the toy. It's easier to resort to medication than competent, authority-based parenting. People are so afraid to, you know, do anything to their kids these days. Um, and uh, it's sad the way that everything's become. Uh, and, you know, there's all kinds of little... Um, it's just 1984, that's all I can say. Um, going back here. Temper tantrums are increasingly being diagnosed as psychiatric disorders like bipolar, ADHD, and Asperger's. When parents abdicate authority of vacuum results and nature doesn't like vacuums, medications fill the role that parents should have fulfilled. The book highlights a doctor who accepted tons of money from the drug company to push these diagnoses and drugs to the kids. You can learn more about it in the book. Over diagnoses and medication to kids for psychiatric disorders is mostly a problem in America. The same period where bipolar in children was exploding in America, it was decreasing in Germany and Spain. The Europeans are skeptical about whether uh, U.S. kids really have bipolar. For every one child in England given a bipolar disorder, 73 in the United States are. ADHD is also way overdiagnosed in America. Teachers recommend getting hyperkids evaluated. The doctors try Adderall. They say, see if this helps. And sure enough, it does. He sits quietly and everyone's happy. Outside of North America, people don't take kids to doctors and get experimental medications for the first line of defense. Teachers outside of America are much more comfortable with their authority, and they're comfortable with using a firm voice to get a kid to stop disru doing disruptive behaviors. When a kid becomes reclusive, spending most of his time in video games and becomes irritable from, uh, from that behavior, parents are quick to take him to get a psychiatric diagnosis of ADHD and medicate him. Parents report the sparkle in the eye of a child going away when they get on these medications. When they get off the medication, the twinkle comes back. Sleep deprivation mimics ADHD almost perfectly. Many kids have gaming consoles in their bedrooms, and their parents have no idea they're staying up late playing games every day. Parents are compensating for sleep deprivation of their kids from screens in, in their rooms by powerful stimulation medications. Kids' failure to pay attention is usually sleep deprivation, not ADHD. The symptoms are strikingly similar. Seroquel, Concerta, Risperidol are being given to kids for bad behavior. A basic duty of a parent is to ensure the child gets enough sleep. Now that we have online gaming popu popular at 2 a.m., parents need to be more assertive with their authority to say no to this. The girls are staying up late on social media. The boys will stay up late gaming. The girls will stay up late on the social media. Help your kids diversify their friends. For example, if your kid only has gamer friends, what's going to happen when you cut his gaming time? If your kid only has soccer friends, what's going to happen when your kid gets an injury and can't play soccer? In the U.S., around 10% of kids are on ADHD medication, and in the U.K., it's only about 0.7. There's a 14 times higher chance that an American kid will get treated with medication for ADHD than a kid in the U.K. One family moved to America from England, and they noticed a stark contrast. In America, all the teachers and doctors, everybody was pushing for her kids to get on an ADHD medication. 
From 2009 to 13, there was a tenfold increase in American ADHD diagnosis. Medicating kids under 12 with mood stabilizers and antipsychotics between 93 and 09 went up 700%. We have turned misbehavior into a medical issue to be diagnosed and medicated rather than trained and corrected. American parents are not doing their job of culturing their kids. Abdication of parental authority leads to prescription medication. In America, doctors say, let's try such and such and see if it helps. But in Europe, the medication is the last resort. 20 or 30 years ago, the school principal, when there's a kid acting out, he would have told the parent, your son is rude and disrespectful and exhibits no self-control. You need to teach him some basic rules about civilized behavior if he is to stay at this school. Now school administrators don't speak authoritatively to parents. They just suggest a medical practitioner or psychologist be consulted, at which the point the kid has been diagnosed with something and given medication. When you tell a parent that their kid is disrespectful, responsibility is placed on the parents to teach the kid. And with responsibility comes authority to do something about the problem. But when a kid is instead referred to psychiatric evaluation, for the responsibility is transferred to the physicians. Parents no longer ask, what should we do to change his behavior? They ask, should he take medication? Medications are now being used for behavior modification, and it's happening in America to an extent unimaginable outside of America. ADHD medications all work the same way. They increase dopamine, and it's very likely that long-term use of these medications in a person uh, result in a person being unable to feel normal feelings. So, frankly, it's like child abuse, really, to be just shoving them on all these meds. If you, and that's me, not the author saying that, if you do feel like you absolutely need a make medication, try a non-stimulant one, such as Stratera, in, uh, Intuniv, or Wellbutrin. Antipsychotics are being used to treat kids' behaviors. It's the same medications used to treat schizophrenia. Kids on these medications are much likely to develop diabetes and obesity. The younger the child, the greater the risk. When kids have diagnoses, the parents respond to their behaviors, saying, He can't help it. He has such and such diagnosis. Of course, the kids learn this too, and all of a sudden, the kids are saying, I can't help it. I have such and such diagnosis. One boy ran around a classroom making buzzing noises and would not stop, ignoring the repeated instruction from the teacher. The teacher finally said, Stop or else. The kid said, Or else what? The teacher said, Or else I'll make you stop. The kid then buzzed even louder, and the teacher tried to stop him, at which point he bit her, drawing blood from her wrist. The teacher called the parent, and the parent said, Well, don't you know he has a psychiatric diagnosis? He probably needs a medication change. You, could have, you, you should have called the psychiatrist directly. Don't you have his number? Yikes. When teachers and parents expect good behaviors, kids often give it. Command, don't ask, don't negotiate. The fact uh, that a parent feels the need to negotiate already undermines their authority. When you lay down a rule and the kid asks why, the answer is because mom or dad says so. American parents two generations ago did this routinely and comfortably. Most British and Australian parents still do. And I'll say here, that is a totally legitimate reason for an, a rule. Of course, as kids get older, they can get more explanation. But the number one thing that they need to learn is obedience. It's like we teach in the church. The, the first law of heaven is obedience. So. <clears throat> okay, doing a checkup. Oh, man, this is another crazy story. Doing a checkup on a six-year-old, he said, All right, we're now going to look at your throat. Of course, the kid had a sore throat. The parent interjected and said, Can the doctor look at your throat? We can get ice cream. So the parent turned it into a negotiation and a bribe when it should have just been a task that quickly got done. The authority of the grown-ups was undermined. The situation became an unnecessarily long, drawn-out drama episode because when it was up to the kid, no, he didn't want the doctor to look at his sore throat. Older children can get more explanations, but younger children in particular should be commanded to do things. And... These explanations, these are ex. Uh, when you give an explanation, it is not a negotiation. It's okay if the kid disagrees or doesn't see things your way. The general rule for authoritative, just right parents is don't ask, command. Parents most horrified by the suggestion to command their kids are most likely to be medicating them. One family meal is uh, the family meal. The family meal is a marker for uh, a constellation of behaviors. Parents who eat with their kids are more likely to control the amount of video games, internet usage, etc. No phones or TV in the background during family meals. 
Kids have more kids who have more meals with their parents are less likely to feel sad, anxious, and lonely. They're less likely to have external problems such as fighting and skipping school. They're more likely to report feeling satisfied with their lives. Kids who eat with their parents are less likely to become obese later in life. On a scale from zero to seven dinners with parents a week, the more dinners with parents, the better off a kid was. The change was statistically significant at almost every step. Kids with six dinners do better than kids with five with parents. In Scotland, Switzerland, and New Zealand, it's less common than in America for families to have radio and TV on during dinner. Parents around the world, but especially in America, mistakenly think that kids' time in dance and sports, all these extracurriculars, is more important than time with family around the dinner table. When you get a report of bad behavior of your kid, don't rush the child to a psychiatrist. Talk to your kid. Parents are the ones with their primary responsibility for a kid to teach and enforce the rules of good behavior. Note, perhaps overdiagnoses and prescription by American doctors also has something to do with American doctors going into medicine for prestige and money rather than for genuine interest in helping people. It also surely represents uncritical thinking on behalf of these doctors. So they have just a trend in, uh, um, so we've seen a trend in aspiring young doctors and nurses who care less about people and more on just getting the degree, getting the comfortable job, getting the title, you know, um, getting everyone to pat them on the back and say how amazing they are. Achievement has dropped dramatically as medication has been on the rise. All right, now highlighting chapter four. Why are American students falling behind? Australian teachers don't have students undermining their authority, trying to break, bring them down. They don't have the culture of disrespect we do in America. Students in Australia routinely thank and praise their teachers. Note, shortly after reading this, I ran into a missionary from Australia at the conference center. I told her what I'd learned about the culture of disrespect in America and how it wasn't like that in Australia. She was like, well, yeah, <laughs> she, she had seen it and was, and, uh, she was definitely knew what I was talking about. Okay. Even elite schools serving affluent kids in America have disruptive, uninvolved, rude boys and girls. Something that the disrespect of the kids in America is the price we pay for greater creativity. But since 1995, American innovation has been remarkably narrow. Innovative leaders are now mostly in Europe and Asia. America is the 11th in the world for, uh, what does that say? Uh, oh, for filing patents per capita. In 1945 to 70, th that was the golden era for American invitation in invention, back when students were much more respectful and differential toward teachers. Studies show that kids' creativity in America has gone down dramatically over the past two decades. <clears throat> Less synthesizing, less creative, less energetic, less emotionally expressive, less talkative, uh, and verbally expressive, less uh, humorous, less imaginative, less unconventional, less lively and passionate, less perceptive, less apt to connect seemingly irrelevant things, less uh, and less likely to see things from a different angle. The culture of disrespect undermines true creativity while strengthening same-age peer conformism. There is nothing creative about a teenager telling an adult to shut up. Even in the 1960s, it was only a very small portion of students involved in the Vietnam protests at schools. Note, this is correct. I recently read a book on this called The Politically Incorrect Guide to the 60s. It goes into detail on this. The 60s were actually a conservative time, but certainly a transition time. The loud minority found, how, found out how to take over universities, etc., and go check out my uh, stuff on that book, uh, some notes on that. Wow, that's a good one. Okay, going on. Um, he points out this book called The Smartest Kids in the World and How They Got That Way. The author says, America overinvests in technology for education. The most successful countries are the utilitarian with no tech gadgets in the schools. The kids don't have wireless clickers, and the board on the wall is only connected to the wall. The Most kids ra just raise their hand. And that works out fine. In America, sports trump academics in school. Outside the U.S., athletes are not excused from class to participate in games. In America, we try to make education cool and fun with screens and gadgets and motivate them to learn. But the solution is in changing the culture so students are less worried about pleasing peers. Teacher training in Finland is highly selective. It's as prestigious as getting into medical school, medical school is in the U.S. In uh, some U.S. colleges, students need a higher academic standard to play football than to be a teacher. American students who enroll in college are less likely than students in other countries to graduate. American students are, less, <clears throat> are studying less at college and learning less at college than a generation ago. 
They show little gains in cognitive skill, reasoning, and critical thinking. Only about a third of them uh, going up more than one point on a hundred point scale in their college years. They see college now as uh, more as building a social network rather than intellectual knowledge. In the uh, 1960s, American college students studied 25 hours a week. In the early 2000s, it was 12 hours. And I'd bet that's overreported. American college students uh, studied less than college students anywhere in Europe, with the expectation, exception of Slovakia. American graduates took mediocre or were uh, look mediocre or worse compared to their graduates, the graduates of other countries. Note with the trend in uh, grading on effort rather than performance and merit, America uh, America is steadily going down, and it's beginning to show. Going on, contemporary American culture and its pop music undermine academic scholarship. Kids outside of America spend more time doing homework and less time complaining about what a drag show is. It's no longer true that a kid will get a good education just because he's in a good neighborhood. Parents must be extra involved to ensure their kids measure up not to American standards, but international. All right, now highlighting chapter five, why kids are so fragile today. Gamer kids are often out of shape and quick to give up at anything physically rigorous. More and more kids aspiring to be professional video game players, and their parents are afraid to deter them from that dream. When the bubble of their amazing self-image is popped, they are lost. The online world creates an alternative culture dominated by mostly, popu mostly uh, younger people. Back in the day, you heard stories of kids who tried out and failed, but worked hard and came back and did great. You're not hearing those stories as much anymore. In the video game world, the games come first, and they're more important than family or health. If a gamer told his peers he's going to get in shape, they would think he's joking. Success in the real world means nothing to them. Kids who do well in school. Uh, and it also talks about um, uh, young ladies who, you know, they're always told how great they are. And um, the second they take, you know, a hard class or something, they just quit altogether. Um, anyway. Uh, kids who do well in school encounter one difficult class and give up altogether. Uh, psychiatrists spend minimal time with a person before they prescribe dangerous medications. There is an extraordinary rise in the amount of youth in America being diagnosed with anxiety and depression. Americans used to be the top of the list for entrepreneurs and people actively looking for work, but now we're near the bottom. The rise in adults unemployed, not looking for jobs, is pronounced in America much more than Europe. A good parent-child relationship is robust and unconditional. Even when there are occasional problems and consequences, the relationship remains intact. But in peer relations, everything is conditional and contingent, leaving the kids to be anxious about immediately answering texts from their friends, etc. They don't want to look incompetent in front of their friends, so they won't take risks or try to develop new skills. Children do need unconditional love and acceptance, but that can't come from peers or a report card. It has to come from parents. Schedule family vacations just for the family. No friends allowed, or all that time your child will just be bonding with the friend as an expensive playdate. The main purpose of a family vacation is to strengthen the bonds between parent and child. Strength, um, uh, strengthen bonds with children by going on walks, drives, etc. on a weekly basis. Find edifying leisure activities like prayer, music, art, and dance. Parent-child uh, parent bonding needs to be a higher priority than extracurriculars or peer activities. Try to live near extended family to give your child more perspectives to connect them to your culture. All right, and a note here, the church has been talking about doing family night, you know, um, before they introduced family home evening. It was kind of normal to have family home evenings and multiple days a week, and the kids were much more involved with the parents, even in, even in the, like, the family, you know, business or the family farm or just all kinds of ways the family was more central. But now, you know, it was inspired council to do family home evening because now... It's just not happening, and uh, it's kind of the lower law to just have one family night a week. So definitely, you know, that's where we are, but we can improve that. Also, um, an important point that I want to make is uh, it's good to live in an area that has similar values. In the 2023 General Conference, October, it was emphasized that we should stand with holy people in holy places. All right, moving on. Your parenting style has to change as your kid grows up. Of course, the newborn needs pure and constant affection. For a toddler, your role is a cheerleader encourager. As the kid gets older, you have to correct, redirect, and point out shortcomings. If your teen can't think of anything fun to do other than gaming, shut down the game. Get him into the real world. 
Parents have the duty to instill their values upon their kids rather than just letting the world impress its values on them. The internet and mobile phones are the primary ways contemporary American culture is pushed on the kids. The more time a kid spends with friends on the phone, the more likely they are to turn to them for guidance, to the friends, for guidance. These devices are widening the generation gap and undermine parental authority. More time kids, the more time spend kids spend on Instagram, the more likely they are to think that Instagram is important. It's not. Um, they become persuaded that their peers know more about what's important than, and their parents don't. In Holland, schools close at noon every Wednesday so kids can have family time midweek. In Geneva, Switzerland, the schools close for lunch two hours a day so kids can go home and have lunch with a parent. Uh, employers often give extra time off work for people to go home and eat lunch with their kids. In Scottish culture, family comes first. Uh, in their airport, there are playgrounds, etc. In America, there's no institutional family time built in, so you have, you have to fight for it. You have to cancel the extracurriculars, etc. Your kid can't attach to you if they hardly ever see you. And i got to throw in a note here that we got to spend you know, that time. And that might mean you have a smaller house. That might mean you don't make as much money. That might mean you don't get the raise. You don't get the additional degree, etc. But you have what counts. And you know, maybe you don't have the feast every meal. But whatever it is you got to do to sacrifice to put family first, uh, I say, glory, hallelujah, do it. So it's pretty hard because we do what we see our neighbors doing and our, our you know, and it's just in our heads now that it's just the go, go, go workaholic. You know, everybody's bragging about, oh, I work so much. And it's really bragging. I think he might bring that up later in this book. But uh, we need to get over ourselves, get over that workaholic bragging and be more family centered, be more, you know, doing these things that actually are important going on. The waning of adult authority is directly related to the waning of attachment to adults, which is replaced with attachment to peers An acorn shell prevents it from gr growing until the time is right. And if it's prematurely opened, it won't grow into a tree. Similarly, a child whose primary attachment is to parents will become successful and well-balanced adult. Breaking the bonds across generations is the key reason kids are so fragile now. Okay, now we're going on to part two of the book, which is the solutions part. This is a lot of fun as well. Okay, so chapter six, we're going to highlight chapter six here. What matters? Self-control has now proven to be more important than openness to new ideas, friendliness, IQ, and GPA to predict whether an 11-year-old will be successful and happy 20 years later. Okay, so self-control, that's the main predictor of, of success and happiness. People are who are more conscientious, meaning self-control and integrity, they earn and save more money, they're happier and more satisfied with life, they're less likely to be obese and more likely to live longer, they're less likely to abuse substances and engage in risky sexual behaviors. No other personality character trait has this strong of a correlation. Many parents assume that good grades and test scores are the biggest predictor to happiness and achievement, but honesty and integrity and self-control matter much more. Note, at the heart of being conscientious is self-discipline and a moral compass guided by conscious and strict training. Going on, going to bed early and getting up early are good measures of deliberate self-control. Self-control is the characteristic most emblematic of conscientiousness. Parents must set the example of self-control by avoiding late-night indulgences and keeping their word. Note, yes, kids hold on to every word. Do your best to follow through, even on the small commitments. And they understand, maybe, to mean yes, so be careful with that. And it's not only the youth these days who have trouble with excessive technology usage. Let's admit we are whipped by these surprisingly addictive time wasters and find solutions for not just youth but adults to be less hooked to the phones and the screens. People who, going on, people who make lots of money can still be in financial distress when they don't know how to live within their means. People with a low IQ can succeed due to discipline, and people with high IQ without discipline often fail. You help an 8-year-old build self-control by saying, no dessert to eat your vegetables. You help a teenager build self-control by saying, no electronics till after homework. In a matter of weeks, a child can change from being impulsive to self-controlled with correct behavior intervention. If you're going to change the rules, tell your children you're going to change them and why. After six weeks of consistent enforcement of rules, your child will be more respectful to you and other adults, and you'll both be enjoying life more. Note, this is a great key. When we train our kids, they actually become more enjoyable. I had a... Um, what was it? 
Okay, so that's what it was. In the um, Anne Sullivan training Helen Keller, you know, Sullivan shows up and she's like basically a disciplinarian, strict disciplinarian with Helen. And she's like, hey, no, you're not just going to walk around. You're not going to eat like an animal with your hands. You're not going to be doing this. Um, you're not just going to pound and get what you want. And the the parents are, they see this because the parents have been really, you know, indulgent with her because they had no clue what to do with her, right? They didn't have the skills. They didn't know that she needed to be treated, you know, um, with high expectations. And uh, the parents in this one movie on it, at least, the dad's like, what what are you doing with her? Like, why do you care? And, and she's like, well, you're paying me to be here, you know? And anyway, um, they say, we just want her to, you know, well, another point they make is we just want her to have good manners. And she's like, no, she, she, she needs to learn how to read. She needs this and that. Like, um, we're going to have high expectations. But um, he says at one point to her, the dad says to Sullivan, he says, do you even like this kid? Um, and Sullivan says, do you? And so... There it is. Nobody likes her because she's totally out of control. So um, I had a, I had some out of control students in my classroom the other day. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not as fun when they're out of control. And you have to do more of the, you know, the, the limits, the boundaries, the, the rewards revoked and all this. And you know, more of raising your hand and more of this and that. Um, anyway, I had a, a kid make a comment. He's like, I don't even like this class. And I said, I don't like it either <laughs> because, uh, you know, th it was just miserable for everybody. So anyway, the point, though, is train your kids so you can actually you can the kids will be happier and you'll be happier. And Joel Skousen does great work with this. Go read his essay on conscience. You can listen to it as well on his website, worldaffairsbrief.com or joelskousen.com. Really brilliant stuff there on conscience and training kids and um, shows just how like once you get a kid under control it's you know not the daily battle it's not the daily negotiation it's not the daily freak out so anyway um, I'll, I'll continue on my tangent here and say many parents today complain of not enjoying parenting and it's likely connected to their letting their kids treat them like doormats and butlers even if there are some hard times of establishing that you really mean business once the parameters are set and the bluffs are called out, things will stabilize, and a structure of safety and peace for all ensues. Parents who discipline their kids correctly and consistently soon find that such discipline is hardly, if ever, needed. The critics complain that these are short-term results only, but the fact is that kids need to learn good behavior, and when they have the experience of good behavior, the Spirit will reward them with joy for that, so they'll know by their experience that 1. They are capable of good behavior, and 2. That it's in their best interest to behave these kids don't even know they can behave because they've never been successful at it make them be successful at it and then they'll learn oh gosh i can be successful at that which means oh i can choose to behave or i can choose to not behave and they begin to make the connection that it's in my best interest to behave okay uh, and of course when i use the word discipline that means multiple things okay it doesn't just mean uh one thing it can mean various techniques and tactics okay but um that's not uh, something I'm going to go into detail on this lecture. Um, so let's go on here. Parenting is not about teaching cliches like follow your dreams um, or, uh, you know, you can do anything you want. You know, that's not that's not what parenting is about. One researcher, Carol Dwick, suggests never telling your kids they're smart, but praising them for working hard instead of so they don't get a self-concept of being smart. That gets uh, smashed when they encounter something they don't know how to do. Kids give up sooner on hard tasks if they're told they're smart versus telling, you know, you tell them they're a hard worker. We praise them for their behavior, not their identity. But interestingly, when it comes to teaching virtue, it's the opposite. Identity works better than behavior. For example, it's better to say, I can see you're a very kind person, than to say, it's a very kind thing you did. In one study, participants were told that the study was to find the prevalence of cheating. And in another, they were told the study was to find the prevalence of cheaters. Okay, cheating, cheaters. Cheating more than doubled when they said they were looking for cheating, rather than when they said they were looking for cheaters. Apparently, kids are more comfortable cheating if they don't see themselves as cheaters. Similarly, kids are more likely to help pro uh, a project if they're encouraged to be helpers, not just help. Now, I want to make an important uh, note here. Okay. 
uh, they learn, this is who I am, therefore this is what I do. This is also why it's critical to learn our identity as children of God. The smart versus hard worker is a tricky one because it doesn't imply a behavior as part of their character, but a, a trait of as part of their character, which eliminates the pathway of effort. <clears throat> um, we, uh, okay, I'll, I'll get to that. I'm going to parse this out a little more momentarily, but first let me make one more comment on the, what the, from the text here. He says, many students report having high ethics, yet they also admit cheating. They're separating cheating from ethical behavior. They see themselves as nice kids who occasionally cheat, not as cheaters. In reality, behavior influences and eventually becomes identity. If you cheat over and over, you are or will soon be a cheater. Your actions over time will change your character. Parents used to teach these moral fundamentals, but no longer do. Okay, now I want to tell you what this means, what we just said. Okay, this is very important. There's a big trend now to only identify behaviors to fail, uh, only identify behaviors and fail to identify the negative identity character traits those behaviors are turning a person into. As the popular saying goes, you made a bad choice, but you're not a bad person. But that's not the whole truth. If you can, and, and I can see how that could be useful to some extent. But if you consistently make bad choices, you are in fact a bad person. And that used to be common knowledge. Okay, we're not saying God doesn't love you. We're saying he doesn't approve. Okay, and yeah, there are bad people out there. It doesn't mean they can't repent. It doesn't mean they don't have the potential to be good. Okay, um, the, uh, if you, okay, the recent advent of refusal to connect behavior with identity is destructive. This does not mean go around pointing fingers. It means when you have to, tell it like it is. Obviously, everyone needs to be reminded that they are children of God with lots of potential, but they also need reality checks. Second Nephi 9 in the Book of Mormon makes it clear that liars go to hell. Not just people who lie, but liars. Guess what that means? There are liars. Okay, You keep lying, your identity becomes liar. The good news of the gospel is that Christ can grant us a return to innocence. He restores our identity as a pure and wholesome being, destined to inherit the kingdom of God, where no unclean thing can enter. All right, I'm going to make that clear. Now let's move back on. Over the past two decades, the ethics of students have gone way down. They want to be successful, and they think their uh, and they think their colleagues are cheating, so they have to cheat to compete. Just do it and go for it. Our popular American culture, the America. Uh, Pepsi billboards say, quote, live for now, close quote. This is a symptom of the collapse of parenting. One father had a kid who had a promising career in football, but the father told the kid, you'll be spending this summer on a fishing boat. He didn't ask the kid, he told him. The kid indeed was sent to the fishing boat where he learned hard work. The father didn't say anything, he just signed his kid up for a tough summer job. At the time, the son resented it, but he later appreciated it as a time where he learned hard work and to see what other people's difficult lives are like. You don't teach virtue by teaching. You teach it by requiring virtuous behavior so that virtuous behavior becomes a habit. There is a popular notion that if you want a kid to be virtuous, you have to explain to them the benefit of being virtuous. But virtuous behavior is what causes people to become virtuous. If you compel your kids to act more virtuously, they actually become more virtuous. Proverbs says, train up a child to behave virtuously. And when he is an adult, he will continue to behave virtuously. Many parents think they need to let their kids do whatever they want, spend hours on games, stay up late, photoshopping selfies on Instagram, and texting. Parents now think that kids can grow up doing whatever they want and suddenly become virtuous when they're adults. Aristotle wrote that a person becomes virtuous by repeatedly practicing virtue. Excellence is not an act. It is a habit. The Hebrew of Deuteronomy, uh, where it talks about uh, teach them diligently, well, it doesn't say teach them diligently. Okay. It says, inscribe them on your children. The Hebrew here is shanun, meaning cut with a knife. To merely say, teach them diligently is watered down. You must, uh, and we're going we're gonna to flush out more of what this means uh, to have that expectation of the, um, of the kid's expectation of the virtuous behavior um, and how it will translate into adulthood. Okay, uh, you must ask kids to pretend that they are um, virtuous before they really are. Action shapes character. 
C.S. Lewis said that the pretense leads to the real thing. Then when you're not feeling particularly friendly, behave as though you are friendly, and a few minutes later you will be. To get a quality, you must begin to behave as though you have it. This is often the only way to get good habits, according to Lewis. Many uh, college graduates go to Wall Street not knowing what to do with their lives and thinking, if you don't know what to do, you may as well make money. They fail to realize that the environment of getting get while the getting is good impacts a person's character negatively. In the 21st century, the assumption is that if you give kids a choice between right and wrong and show them why they should choose the right, they will choose the right on their own. This is a mere guess about human nature, which evidence does not support. Rather than giving kids the option of healthy and unhealthy lunch, require them to eat the healthy lunch for years. Then they will have learned the benefits and the habit of that character. The ideal of education is not to have a bunch of things, it's to learn culture. Uh, when kids aren't cultured, they have no standard to measure pop culture against. They don't know that today's music is garbage because they haven't seen the real good stuff. They don't know that porn, masturbation, and video games are just cheap substitutes for what life really has to offer. They don't know how to compare the virtuous lifestyle of Mother Teresa to the selfish lifestyle of popular figures. So, you gotta teach them about Mother Teresa. Self-control and honesty are not innate. They must be taught. You can't rely on U.S. schools today to do this job. Some people call it abdicating parental authority as enlightened wisdom, but it is neither. It is mere retreat from adult responsibility. And a note here, I want to point out Ayn Rand, despite her obvious flaws, which the author points out, uh, does Ayn Rand does a good job depicting some of this in her books, that there are um, fewer and fewer people willing to take responsibility, willing to act, willing to make decisions, and more people who simply refer you to someone else to solve the problem. What is life if we never take the blame, good or bad? People are no longer willing to risk, no longer willing. They are they are living shell lives, ever hiding behind the next uh, bigger bloke. <laughs> okay, moving on now to chapter 7, Misconceptions. This is a really good one. People think, and we're actually almost done, so yay. People think if they prevent their kids from doing stuff they want to do, the kids will be crazy as soon as they leave the house, having not learned how to choose good behavior on their own. But longitudinal studies show that well-behaved kids are more likely, more likely to grow up to be well-behaved adults. Kids raised by permissive parents are more likely to get in trouble as adults. People who think kids grow up in... People who think that kids growing up in strict homes will become wild adults. Often, they are basing that on some popular movie or something Oprah said. Research provides no support for this notion, which and flatly contradicts it. Big point there. Extremely popular idea. Oh, you can't control your kids. They'll just be wild and crazy as soon as they leave your house. Nonsense. If you're hiring a new employee and one candidate has a track record of honesty and hard work, whereas the other candidate has a track record of idleness and troublemaking, which person will you hire? The same logic applies of how we treat kids and what adults they'll what kind of adults they'll turn into. Parents used to understand this. The line of what a child is and what a child, uh, excuse me, the line of what a child is and what an adult uh, is isn't so clear as the legal, legal age makes it appear. There's no magic transfer of responsibility that takes place on the 18th birthday. So with parenting, there's too hard, there's too soft, and there's just right. Too hard parents rarely show any love, and they have excessive demands. Too soft parents don't have rules and consequences. If you are not enforcing rules, you are too soft. Just right parents show love and have consistent rules. Just right means being both strict and loving. The public understanding over the past 30 years of what it means to be just right as a parent has drifted steadily away from authoritative to permissive. Okay, and let me just say here, this book, you th might think, oh, he's hammering the, the rules and the discipline and the, and the expectations and the, all this and the high standards. But that's, you know, yeah, he is. That's what the book's about because every other book you're going to read on parenting is just hammering the, the love, the relationship, the soft, the, the smushy. And that stuff's important too. But he's saying we are way off on this. We are so out of balance. Okay, that's what he's saying. Okay, let's move on. Parents worry that uh, if they are strict, their child will be an outcast. The only one not allowed to do what others are doing. Often the kids are fine with a peer not having a phone. And it's the parents who are most concerned. Why are you not letting your kid have a phone? Oh, your kids. It's the parents often who are 
you know, and I think that's because the parents are like, have this, maybe this deep conscious feeling that they can't recognize that they're being too permissive. And so they want to attack the responsible parents to make themselves look better. Okay. Uh, he suggests some books by Meg Meeker called strong fathers, strong daughters, the 10 secrets every father should know and strong mothers, strong sons, lessons mothers need to raise extraordinary men. Meg Meeker didn't let her son play video games. Her son insisted that when he was an adult living on his own, he would get video games and be like other guys. He did, but he ended up selling them because they only collected dust. As a youth, he didn't identify as a gamer. His identity involved people skills and various cultured interests and hobbies. He was not impressed by video game skills as he matured. He observed that gamers were often clumsy in real life situations. Age matters. If a boy starts playing games as a young person, they will it will imprint on his brain in a way that it won't matter so much when he's 18. Uh, it won't be like his identity. The young brain is very plastic and immature. Note, this is a great point. We must make limits on minors. We are responsible to care for so that they become balanced adults. Without limits as children, they can develop toxic additions which can last throughout life. Kids depend on adults to help guide them. Longitudinal studies show that kids who spend many hours a week playing violent video games become more hostile, less honest, less kind. This is the impact of years of playing those games. Ban the first-person shooters games from the house. If your kid likes shooting things, let them go to a gun club and really shoot things. If your, kid, uh, if your child's friend plays violent video games, do not let him go to that friend's house. It is not important for your children to be popular. Newsflash! Being popular in the U.S. today often entails unhealthy behavior and attitudes, beginning with a disregard for parental authority. Being kind and controlled is what matters. Kind and self-controlled. That's what we want to teach our kids. It is, a re it is realistic for you to hold your children responsible for their behavior. Just right parents ex expect their children to behave the same way out of the home as they do in the home. That's called integrity. Parents can drop by a friend's house to see what the kids are doing unannounced, etc. Parents don't have to choose between being strict or loving. Some parents don't give their children a phone at all, even through high school, and there's no need for it. Other peers don't really care. It's the other parents who get on your case. Parents peer pressure other parents to give kids phones. Note, this is great counsel. If a kid needs a phone for something, they can borrow their parents' borrow the parents phone of the house they're at but the big picture is that phones are much less needed than people think particularly for youth it is never acceptable for your child to be disrespectful to you it's okay for a kid to say i don't agree with you but it's never okay for a kid to say shut up don't allow that language in your house show kids that people can disres disagree respectfully disagree about something casual non-personal talks like food and politics this teaches them to respectfully disagree on more important topics without disliking the other person Listen to each other. State why your opinion is different. Many parents don't want to interfere with what supposedly makes their kid happy. But this is confusing happiness with pleasure. Many kids value the virtual world of video games and relationships in that virtual world more than the real world abilities and relationships. The gaming world may give them pleasure, but it will not give them sustained lasting happiness. The pleasure often transforms into addiction. The hallmark of addiction is decreasing pleasure over time. Tolerance develops and the game becomes impulsive, involuntary, unthrilling. The addict cannot find pleasure in anything else. Happiness comes from fulfilling your potential, which is beyond online gaming. Parents concerned about their kids' gaming should follow their instincts and intervene, even if the kid claims they can make a living off of it and have friends from it. The desire to live in the virtual world is an uneducated desire. It isn't easy to intervene, but if you're, uh, but you're not trying to win your kid's approval you're trying to do your job as a parent to help your child find their potential. You may not know precisely where your child's potential is, but surely it's not in 20 hours a week online gaming. The same applies to limiting social media, texting, etc. Um, he hits on those, but there's other things, of course. Uh, the job of a parent is to teach a child to enjoy things that are higher than cotton candy. Video games, Instagram, texting are the cotton candy of today's pop culture. Parents must battle the culture and the culture of live for now and to teach in its place integrity today's culture message is that your child is fulfilled when he gets what he desires that a child knows best how to be fulfilled better than their parents the popular message today is do whatever feels good whatever floats your boat note i will point out this is like the slogan of the rolling stones which they adopted from the satanist leader alester crowley and i mean satanist the, the slogan was, quote, do as thou wilt, this is the whole of the law, close quote. 
And P.S. The Beatles praised this guy and featured him on an album cover. Okay, a lot of this, a lot of this stuff was uh, coming in before a lot of people knew it was, and uh, there's a lot of uh, celebs that need to be not celebrities anymore. Arthur C. Brooks pointed out that today's goal of do it if it feels good equates our morals with protozoa. Living just for the present it's, is the culture of infants. Being a human means more than gratification of immediate desires. It involves service, minister, mastery of the arts, faith in something greater than oneself, discipline in a pursuit of a higher goal. That's what it means to be human. It is false that um, to love someone you must trust them. Just because you love your child doesn't mean you have to believe they're always telling the truth. Adult relationships do involve more trust, but parent-child relationships are different than marriage relationships. The parents who think their child will never lie to them are wrong. Your child um, is more likely to lie to you than anyone else because they don't want to let you down. Though cheating is viewed casually today, they have a feeling that their parents' morals of no cheating is correct, so they are very likely to lie to their parents about cheating. And note, the other... Uh, and other morals commonly rejected in public by peers which parents wouldn't approve of, such as sloppy dress, foul language, inappropriate premature dating, and intimate relations, movies watched with peers, skipping class, skipping homework, drug use, pornography use, etc. A generation ago, there was an alliance between parents and schools. If kids cheated in school, their parents would be notified and given and give consequences to reinforce school discipline. Today, when a school tries to punish a kid, the parent often op opposes it. One school teacher reprimanded a kid for cheating on a test in front of the class. The parents had friends on the school board and were wealthy donors. They made some phone calls, and the teacher was informed that if she didn't want to lose her job, she needed to apologize to the girl in front of the whole class. So, the teacher did so. She told the class, The district doesn't care if you cheat. If you do so, I won't say a word. And I'll say... Good for her, at least trying to expose the corruption of the district. More and more organizations are chasing out all the honest people with their dishonest policies. And this is a, there's a new trend now for school administrators to get rid of tests in general. This, uh, there isn't a, a point of a test where the students are allowed to use whatever the resources they want. At that point, it's no longer a test. It's a, no longer demonstrating what they know. It wipes out the integrity of the entire classroom. It trades education for cheap tricks. Elder Bednar talked about the importance of tests in a recent conference talk. Eliminating tests only, I think that was 2020 maybe? Eliminating tests only further enables kids to waste class time. Whatever the grandiose theory behind eliminating tests is, the reality is that it encourages idleness. It's like communism. It might sound nice, but it simply doesn't work in practice. The correctness of a theory is limited by how much it works in practice. Going on back to the text here. Some parents fear that if they're strict with their kids, their kids won't love them anymore. But remember, the job description of a parent. The reward of a parent is knowing that you've done your job well. Merely seeking affection from your kids is not the top goal. Often, single parents are lonely and want excessive affection from their children, and they trade their authority as a parent for this. In a relationship with an adult, you are equals, and everything is negotiable. You, uh, Where everything is negotiable, uh, uh, you can't give orders. The relationship with the child is different, has to be. You have to set the rules and enforce them, uh, even if the child doesn't agree. The most common error in parenting is becoming too permissive out of a desire to win the affection of your kids. You know, something that um, has been pointed out is that, you know, we're often sensitive in our conscience to when we're too rough, too, um, you know, too sh you know, when we do something that crosses the line of, oh, I shouldn't have done that, that was too mean. But do we listen to our conscience the other way too? When it says, hey, you should have corrected that behavior, but you just let it slide. You didn't even address it. Hey, you should have you should have prompted that kid. You should have given that kid a consequence. You should have had a discussion about what the rule is and what the expectation is. So there's two sides of conscience, okay? That um, there's the there's the too strict and there's the too permissive. And and uh, uh, this author makes the claim that the most common error in parenting today is being too too permissive out of a desire to win affection of your kids. And I'd say that's a pretty accurate diagnosis of our society parents in our society sometimes kids moving on now sometimes kids express hatred to their parents and sometimes the parents aren't too fond of their misbehaving kids but the parents must stand by their authority to say no when their gut feeling tells them when misfortune befalls a kid the parent often laments saying i knew i should have avoided the situation etc or i knew i shouldn't let my kid go to that party or i knew i shouldn't let this but they didn't listen to the conscience they let it slide 
Even if you're concerned that doing your job as a parent will lose the affection of your child, you must do your job. All right, getting close to the finish here. Chapter 8, Teach Humility. Parents say they want their kids to grow up to be kind and happy, but they don't know how to make that happen. They often confuse the achievement with fulfillment. Many American parents have confused virtue with success. Humility is now an un-American virtue. They teach that the only real sin is failure. People don't even know what humility means. They think it's saying you're stupid when you know you're smart. And that's psychosis, even if well-intended. Humility means being as interested in others as you are yourself. It's listening to others and being interested in their views. Often kids are assigned to write about how amazing they are. We often hear, dream until your dreams come true. A better slogan would be, work until your dreams come true. Even better would be to say, work to pursue your dreams, but realize that life is what happens along the way. And I'm going to say, an even better uh, slogan would be, work to pursue God's will. That's That seems the best. All right, moving on. High self-esteem at a young age sets a person up for disappointment and resentment at age 25. When parents and teachers carefully nurture self-esteem, it often results in crash after college when they learn that just because everyone said they're amazing doesn't mean they really are. A culture of self-esteem leads to a culture of resentment, confusion, and hostility. About people who actually do succeed, courage involves recognizing risks and your own limitations. And I want to say it's okay to tell people they're amazing because they are, right? But um, you're not going to you know, lie and say, you know, hey, you're in great health. Why don't you go play basketball? Hey, you're in, not that basketball is something that anyone should aspire to do professionally. Uh, or say, Hey, you know, good for you. Go be an engineer when, you know, you suck at math. You know, maybe if that's like your extreme passion, you can go get better at math. But, um, anyway, uh, the, the author makes good point here that, uh, you know, nowadays we're all just about trumping it up. Yeah. Yeah. Rah, rah, rah. You know, go do all this nonsense. And uh, of course you can, you know, and uh, we we don't give them intelligent uh, and reasonable goals and careers, you know, and, and oh, everyone has to go to college. Oh, gosh, if you don't go to college, man, you are doomed for all time and eternity. You know, you just, you oh, man, you don't go to college, your life's going to suck. You're not going to get anything, you know. Uh, there's this funny, uh, um, the teaching nowadays is... Uh, Hey, you want a beautiful wife? Go make a lot of money. You want her to never complain? Make even more money. <laughs> so it's uh, really kind of pretty pathetic of what we've uh, become. And, you know, it's, Utah is no exemption. Utah's often way worse at it than others. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it is what it is. Um, there's some shaping up. There's some, there's some humbling. There's some Zion that needs to get in our souls. Okay, uh, humble people rejoice at the success of others. Protagonists in the work of Ayn Rand are unabashedly selfish. They pursue their own interests relentlessly and unapologetically. None of their major protagonists are parents, nor is the author. It is immature when you think the world is about what you want. Now, I love Ayn Rand, and I'm going to go on a little tangent here on why I don't think his, uh, you know, things that he said just here about Ayn Rand are totally true. But I, I, I love Ayn Rand's work with many asterisks with as in with many uh as so long as this so long as this okay it's all about not throw out the baby with the bathwater when it comes to rand obviously she has a lot of things wrong okay here's my little rant that i wrote here i don't think this is a totally correct representation of the heroes of rand of course he is right that they are too self-centered but the heroes definitely have some redeeming qualities even in this regard they treat their employees with respect and equity based on merit they recognize the evils of forced redistribution of wealth, and even though they aren't themselves parents, they show many proper social governing dynamics in how they work with their peers and society. Interestingly, Joseph Smith taught that self-aggrandizement is a true principle when you are uh, doing God's work, in so much as the bigger you get, the more you can help others. The question was put to him, Joseph, okay, I'm going to read the quote here. Quote, Joseph, is the principle of self-aggrandizement wrong? Should we seek our own good? His answer, it is a correct principle and may be indulged upon only one rule or plan, uh, upon only one rule or plan, and that is to elevate benefit and bless others first. If you will elevate others, the very work itself will exalt you. Upon no other plan can a man justly and permanently aggrandize himself. Close quote. That's from the True Madsen, Truman Madsen Joseph Smith tapes. Consider God himself. If he has less 
If he had less power and influence than he does, he would not be in the position he is to offer mercy and goodness to so many. I think the heroes of Rand ultimately would benefit the lives of their peers, but it is true that the heroes in the story do lack principles of chastity and religion and many more, uh, and are more heroes of the terrestrial level than celestial level. And I have a, if you're interested in Rand and analysis of that, and particularly in LDS analysis, I've got a whole thing on that. Uh, richardsonstudies.com. Um, and if you have any questions about finding any of this stuff, just email me. The email's on the website too. When a kid has learned humility, they are more likely to recognize whether they're trying to do something just to look good or they're doing that thing because they're genuinely interested in it. it talks about this young aspiring girl who... Oh, she was going to get the best grades. She was going to do all this. She was going to get all the college credit in high school. She was, she was going to take these advanced physics classes, three of them at a time, even though she'd never taken physics before because that was the cool thing to do, of, to be the coolest, best, smartest kid. She gets in, <laughs> flops it completely. And she's like, oh, no, I'm not a genius, perfect kid like everyone told me I was. And she basically drops out of school and just quits trying altogether because she didn't learn any resilience. She just All she knew was that she was the best person ever and could do anything ever, 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 with no restraints ever. And, uh, yeah, freshman year of college is a good way of uh, hacking people down to size. I know it was good hacking me down to size, some big reality checks. And it's sad that we don't teach our kids more uh, to prepare them better for these kind of things. Okay, moving on. Uh, in the era of walk tall, stand proud, it takes courage to teach humility. And I want to point out, yes, true humility is both empowering and a unique path in life these days. As the old saying goes, you may not be climbing the ladder everyone else is, but you are climbing a more important ladder. People often won't recognize that and could call you a fool. But your goals are not. Com but your goals are completely different from their goals. For example, you might lose a soccer game because you value your teammates having fun, so you pass the ball to the less skilled player. You might be removed from an intense program requiring perfect attendance because you had to help someone at a critical time. You might be a friend to someone who isn't particularly friendly because you're not in it for you, but for them. You might make a lower wage because what you're doing in the day creates meaning in the value in the lives of others, or it's something that it's a talent that God's blessed you with that you're going to pursue naturally, even if it doesn't, you know, have the biggest bucks. Naturally, all of this must be done in wisdom and order, but remember, God's ways are higher than our ways. His wisdom and order may look different than the wisdom of others. Everyone has different ways they can contribute, and we all can and should consider doing more than we are currently doing. This can mean more time on the clock. It can mean, it can mean replacing current activities with others, etc. Okay, now back to the text. Many families require their kids to do rigorous chores, even if friends are visiting or even if they have a lot of homework. Many parents who can afford to hire out manual labor choose to have their kids do it to teach their kids the value of hard work. If it doesn't require an electric current, you can usually do it yourself with family. It's a mistake to hire out all the manual chores so your kid has more time for schoolwork and extracurriculars. You send an unintended message that your kids are too important for such menial tasks teach kids that the world does not revolve around them. They are a member of a family with obligations to the family, and those obligations are paramount. One family did not allow their kid to go to an after-ball game party because the ball game was the time for recreation, and then it was time to go back and do chores. When the parents uh, reasonably limit recreation time of kids, it's common for other parents to pressure those parents to be less responsible. Teach your kids early on that they won't be the cool kid. Another news flash. And for an American kid to be cool nowadays, it means dressing provocatively, disrespecting your parents, staying out late at night. Don't allow any of that. And I'm going to say, have this conversation with your kid. You need to sit them down and, and tell them point blank, you know. Denzel Washington once came home. And, and, and let me just say one more thing. The, par the parents often say the opposite now. It's like, hey, do this and that. That's how you be cool. And this, oh, you got to do this and that and this and that. And you got to wear this and that. And you got to act this and that way. And you got to. So I think we're teaching directly opposite, usually, of what should be taught. Okay, uh, going on. Denzel Washington once came home proud of how he became a star. His mom rebuked him, saying, you don't know how many people have been praying for you and how long. Go get a bucket and wash the windows. The culture of social media is the antithesis of humility. Okay, that's a quote from the author. The culture of social media is the antithesis of humility. Close quote. 
social media is used as used by youth are all about self-promotion. It's all about broadcasting, aggrandizing the self. Usually when a parent is trying to help a kid, but the kid remains rude, the root cause is access to social media. It's not about whether or not you should be your kid's friend on social media. If your kid is into the culture of disrespect, get them off the media. All right, now to chapter 9. Highlighting chapter 9, in, it's called Enjoy. When was the last time you did something with your kid that you both totally enjoy? Most American parents, especially mothers, do not enjoy much of the time they spend with their kids. American women report uh, preferring cleaning, cooking, and just about everything else above child care. American mothers spend more time on child care, but less, but enjoy it less than French women. Most likely, the French kids are better behaved, better trained. In the book, All Fun, All Joy and No Fun, The Paradox of Modern Parenthood by Jennifer Senior, she points out that mothers do more routine activities with kids than fathers do more play with kids. She also says American mothers multitask, trying to be moms while they do homework or professional work, housework. Men are uh, less likely to attempt this multitasking. American women with children regret uh, report feeling rushed more often than American women without children. But American men with children don't report feeling more rushed than American men without children. <clears throat> it's no fun to try and field texts and emails while you're with your kid. When you're with your kid, focus on your kid. Spend Perhaps spend time together outdoors so you're not tempted to look at a screen. I've, I've met some people who say they only check their email once a week. You know, not everybody can do that, but uh, maybe have some kind of limit, you know. Put that dang phone in a different room for a couple hours, uh, you know, something. Uh, so spend time outdoors together so you're not tempted to look at a screen. Kid, and boy, nowadays, you ought to have your TV in your car and you got to have your handheld games in the mountains. It's like, holy crap, enough is enough. Kids may resist going on outings at first, but they enjoy it when you're there. Sometimes kids don't want to go do family fun, and the parent has to say, too bad, you're going. Once the kids discover how they can have fun with their parents, the relationship totally changes. Spending fun time with your child is not an optional elective to be squeezed in after you've done the work of the day. It is essential. You must plan for it, insist on it, and make time for it. And notes like the family proclamation says, it says you need wholesome recreation activities, keyword there, wholesome, uh, to have a good family. Moving on now, one successful college football player reported that during his senior year of high school, even though he was very successful and could have spent all his time at parties, his favorite pastime was to spend the evening at home with his parents. He declined invitations to parties in order to stay home with his parents, to play board games with them or watch old movies with them. His parents were both strict and loving. In this family, the kids were not allowed to play at a home where there were no parents, and dates had to be interviewed by the parents, and dates were not allowed into bedrooms. The kids thought they would need therapy from all the terrible things their parents were doing to them, as in all these rules. Then the kids went to college and watched it was everyone else's lives who fell apart, who needed, everyone else needed therapy, who the the parents with the permissive kids, they were the ones with the whacked out lives, not them. Little things make the best happiness. Simple family activities like a board game or a sport and roll old movie. Absolutely no screens at dinner. Uh, cars advertise ch children entertainment systems in the back seat. The mother is shown smiling. Th thumbs up, big smile. And the children with headphones smiling. It's it says uh, it's um, it's as though the mother is saying, "Isn't this great? We can spend hours together and don't I don't have to talk to them at all." Everyone is in a rush. Take advantage of what time you have to talk, even in the car. Don't allow your kid to separate themselves from you by putting on the headphones in the car or any other time they're with you, okay? Kids with you, no headphones. It requires a significant investment of time to devote attention to kids. Adults and children need to cut back on their schedules to get family time. Many parents and kids are simply trying to do too much. They send an unintended message that relaxed time together as a family is the least important thing in life. Many parents are overbooked, and instead of cutting back, they overbook their kids so their kids can be as stressed and overwhelmed as they are. Outside of America, it's rare to find people boast about how busy they are and how sleep-deprived they are. It's rare to find full-time parents outside of America who spend all day chauffeuring kids around over, even over the summer holiday. Americans complain about their busy lives, and it's actually a form of boasting. Parents need to teach their kids balance, to not be overscheduled. The joy of quiet moments. When parents overly emphasize skills that the child can gain, they are sending an unintended message that what you do is more important than who you are. That achievements matter more than family. 
Don't push a kid to live as though they are continually preparing for a college application. When kids learn not to worry about what they look like in the eyes of others, they can uh, do less and become more. Now, I want to explain here. This do less isn't to say be a bum hippie. It is to say less focus on trivial things and monetary things and more focus on eternal things like relationships, spirituality, wisdom, truth. Okay? Uh, Hugh Nibley likes to say, we all have a full-time job discovering the history of this world we live on. And true it is. We're a bunch of ignoramuses. But when you are chronically overscheduled with work and extracurriculars or finances or other trivialities, cutting things out of the schedule is a great place to start. And the only way you'll begin to have time for culture, for wholesome, modest recreation, which is an essential ingredient of family life. <clears throat> you might have to find you might have to move to find a less stressful job or even learn how to become comfortable on less income. Parents must teach priorities. They must teach the meaning of life. Note, the excuse is often made. We have to provide. Uh, what is really is happening is the endless toil to have the bigger house, the fancy clothes, the beauty products, the elaborate vacations, the spacious bedrooms, when usually tossing a ball at home will suffice on, when it comes to vacations. Both, uh, both men and women must watch out for what, uh, for what they're doing, for what they're asking each other to do, and keep a razor focus on essentials or we will miss it. Okay, chapter 10, The Meaning of Life. This one's really fun. The middle class script is ever, everyone in America repeats is one, work hard in school so you can get into a good college. Two, get into a college so you can get a good job. Three, get a good job so you can get good at, uh, make a good living and have a good life. Uh, the problem is all three of these are false. Okay, number one, working hard in school is no guarantee you'll get into a good college. Number two, a good college is no guarantee of a good job. Many graduates are waiting tables or unemployed. Three, having a good job is no guarantee of having a good life. And I'll say uh, this good college nonsense is nonsense. Uh, in Germany and Switzerland, there's no shame if a kid wants to become an auto mechanic instead of going to university, even if both the parents are university professors. <clears throat> but in America, there is a stigma attached to being a mechanic and a lack of respect attached to blue collar work. Many American parents think that the primary purpose of K-12 schooling is to get into an elite college, but K-12 should actually be to prepare us for life, not more school. Many of the skills needed for life are different from the skills needed for getting into a top university. Kids focused on college avoid classes that might be difficult since they might not get an A. Even if the classes interest them, they rather choose the uninteresting classes they know they can get A's in. They sign up for extracurriculars, not because they're in interesting, but because they might look good on a resume. They aren't, uh, they aren't living. They're performing. Sadly, parents encourage this performing. Note, it's quite tragic that the graduate must know the various classes of worms, part of the required biology curriculum, but need not know anything of farming, astronomy, nutrition, construction, finance, and so forth. Of course, schools can never teach it all, but I wish they would uh, teach more practical things. Going on, young people choose... Uh, to be doctors because it looks like a clear path to a fulfilling life but these people often don't have basic things about life figured out they don't know what they really want in life uh, what will really make them happy and note maybe this is why they're just why they're just prescribing everyone medication because they really don't know the answers um, there are many miserable wealthy people who work 80 hours a week and loathe what they do if you loathe what you do you are a slave Time is precious. No amount of money can recover lost time. This leads to resentment for what they do, such as doctors who resent their parents. Note, I will point out, on the one hand, fathers are primarily responsible to provide, and that can mean a less preferred job. But, in so much as there are reasonable alternatives, and in so much as we often uh, are living for wealth rather than for faith-based approach to finance, of meeting our basic needs and setting a little aside for times of trouble, to these uh, extents we can and should find more fulfilling work. And another note, someone recently spoke to me. Oh, and uh, you'll want to read uh, Boy Crisis by Warren Farrell on that. Okay, another note, someone recently spoke to me that we are seeing Isaiah's times of rude youth. And so it is. But I say, uh, we cannot go on in such permissive management of them. The plague is of the authorities, not just the youth. The wickedness is compounding across generations. Moving on, he says the middle class script can make your kid more risk averse and more and cautious, and that does not help him prepare for life. Willingness to fail is one of the keys to life, but it's not part of the script of getting perfect grades 
and going to the perfect school, so they never take those risks. They never attend the interesting classes. Note, they quickly learn to oppress all feelings not calculated to maximize profits. And note, while uh, well, uh, well is it said that failure is a good teacher and that a it is a stamp of maturity to accept sunk costs, to accept that you were wrong, um, to accept that uh, you were not perfectly wise, and to move forward even when it hurts to do so rather than to stay where you are. People who can't admit they were wrong often live a life of resentment and chronic disappointment, not to mention chronic failure. Moving on now. Ensure your children, um, empower your children to take risks and congratulate them not only when they succeed, but when they fail, because failure brings humility, which can bring growth and wisdom and an openness to new things in a way that success almost never does. Steve Jobs said getting fired from Apple was the best thing that could have happened to him. The heaviness of being successful was replaced by the lightness of being a beginner again, being less sure about everything, freeing him to enter one of the most creative periods of his life. All right, this is really fun. An Australian school headmaster, Robert Grant, was known to say, quote, I hope your child will be severely disappointed by his time at this school, close quote. This, is, this was to say, um, uh, let's see, this, uh, this was a way of saying your kid needs to learn that there are hard things in life, that if a kid does not experience disappointment in school, he will be unprepared for it when it comes in real life, that he will react with quitting rather than trying when he fails if he has experience with hardship and being in over his head. The right kind of education should prepare your kid to handle failure, to slip loose of a dream when the dream is over, and to move to another field of endeavor with no loss of enthusiasm. Many schools now, especially in America, don't teach kids any life skills because they're too busy preparing them to get grades. And I'll say here, that getting good grades shouldn't be your top priority. And uh, a lot of kids don't they just freak out, totally go ballistic if they if they don't get an A. And the parents, too. It's the horror of a teacher dealing with that crap. Uh, moving on. A movie called Flashdance features a character telling another that if you give up on your dream, you die. The false I These false ideas are being pushed. That if you work hard enough, it will happen. That if you build it, they will come. Parents are often stuck in this toxic script, which allows only one trajectory, one storyline. It's toxic for the same reason that social media is. It's all about me, my success. They equate fulfillment with personal success. Note, Mother Teresa taught that we should not try to find how far along we are on the journey. We should just keep serving. This is a brilliant focus on what matters most, everything but the self. And uh, check out my stuff on Mother Teresa. Um... There's books about Mother Teresa that are pretty easy to read and awesome because she was really plain spoken. And it's hard to argue with Mother Teresa because she was one of the greatest saints of all time. And uh, let's just go on here. Uh, teach kids to focus on who they are, not what they do. Note, this is not to say teach kids to be self-centered narcissists. It's to say that they need to understand their character matters more than their achievements. Going on, people need to face the fact, the fear, that their endless achievements won't lead to fulfillment. It's about who you truly are, not who you pretend to be, even if you never get noticed for your integrity. Life is not a movie about your personal success. Responsible parents need to tell kids that their dreams won't come true, that they do need to find another dream. Parents afraid of their authority will never speak of these difficult truths, but if you don't, who will? There's no point in letting your kids relax and do what they desire if you uh, have not first educated that desire. Once desire has been educated, youth can enjoy leisure time more fully. Such an important point right there. The whole concept of wholesome recreation is just lost to us. We think recreation uh, is a spa and a movie, and it's not. You can you can get uh, you know refreshed in actually useful ways okay and and i get it oh refreshing is in and of itself useful but yeah but there's things you can do that are more refined that that will actually refresh you even more and etc it's like going to church and taking the sacrament and all that you know yeah you could uh, be fishing when fishing is refreshing but the church is even more refreshing see that's the thing okay 
It's all about priorities, good, better, and best. And we're saying raise the bar big time. Okay, moving on. Uh, parents must instill meaning in their children. Without meaning, kids are more likely to become anxious and depressed. Once kids have a sense of meaning, they can pursue achievement with confidence because they know why the achievement is worth pursuing. The main purpose of school is not to prepare for university, but prepare for life. The purpose of life involves meaningful work, loving someone, and supporting a cause. When your kid wants to know why they should work hard at school, you need to be able to answer with a bigger picture than just getting into college and making a good living. Teach them that experience matters more than acquisition. The most serious consequence of shifting to a peer-oriented society is that the parent is no longer able to provide the big picture to the kid as the kid looks to the peers to learn what is about what really matters instead of the parents. K-12, K-12 school is now a race to nowhere. They're in a rat race to get good grades, to go to a good college, but they have no idea beyond the vague promise of a comfortable job at the end of the rainbow and the lack of any coherent alternative. Okay, they have no alternative. Pursuing fame, wealth, good looks, as pop culture insists, for their own sake, impoverishes the soul. Set meaningful goals and work toward them with integrity. All right, now for the conclusion. Conclusion. We must recreate a culture of respect, as was depicted in the old-time movies like Andy Griffith's show. Movie characters used to be good people, good role models for kids. The word ordinary has become a derogatory term, synonymous with meaningless. Your neighbors are going to accuse you of isolating your kids, but you can be courageous for your child's sake so they can grow up to be brave and humble like you. Don't try to be authoritative one moment and cool the next. Your job is to be the authoritative parent, not the cool peer. There are three things emphasized in this book unique to America. One, the culture of disrespect and live for now is unique to America. Americans now advocate letting kids do whatever they want. Two, it is also only in America that powerful psychiatric drugs are the first rather than the last resort. Three, it is also unique to America that we overschedule our kids and ourselves rather than boasting about how busy you are, boast about laying on the grass and looking for shapes in the clouds with your kids. There is no greater responsibility between human beings than that of a parent to a child. The parents must not only feed and clothe the child, but instill in them virtue and a longing for integrity and to teach them the meaning of life. The collapse of parenting has led to an explosion, particularly in America, of fragile, medicated children. You must create an alternative culture in your home and exert without apology the primacy of family ties. Note, this is why many are turning to homeschooling, though there are many other important ways to do such, modifying, such as modifying holiday traditions, weekly routines, Sabbath observance, etc. <clears throat> and finally, teaching children virtue and character is not an extracurricular optional activity for superior parents. It is the duty of all parents, notwithstanding their imperfection. This is a mandatory assignment, and we have to do it our best at it. We cannot abdicate it. Thank you so much for uh, reviewing this awesome book with me. And God bless you and me in our efforts to parent and be what we need to be.